one of the um, one of the big difficulties in clinical trials always was how do you get people in them? How do you recruit people for clinical trials? The most of the the world doesn't really know or know much about clinical trials, and if the first time they hear about a clinical trial is when they've just been diagnosed with a serious disease, it's a little could be a little um, upsetting. Uh, first of all, you're not really focusing on this this second this the separate issue of a clinical trial. You're trying to process the fact that you've just been diagnosed with this disease, and once you do start thinking about it, you may not be so happy about the idea that. The treatment, nobody really knows for sure that the doctor you have picked out says he doesn't really know for sure which treatment you should take and, and he or she is planning to flip a coin uh, to decide which treatment to get. And that, that, that is something that could be pretty frightening for somebody who, who's just had a serious, uh, serious illness diagnosed. So in the, in the uh, mid to late 70s, um, a very um, <coughs> eminent uh, professor of biostatistics um, at Harvard, Marvin Zellin, um, developed this um, very clever design uh, that uh, proposed that if you randomize people before um, you did the informed consent, so that when you did the informed consent, you could tell them, well, we're doing this clinical trial, and we're comparing A versus B, and if you agree to B in this trial, you know, you would get B. And his theory was if you... Um, if you told people what they were going to get, that they would be more apt to agree to participate in the trial than if they had to agree before they knew which they were going to get. And he, he felt um, that, you know, no matter which one they got, if, the, if they knew, it, it was the not knowing that was the, big, that was the big barrier. Now, you know, I don't know how much, you know, evidence there was for that. But um, so he, he developed this design, and there's, you know, statistically, there's certainly nothing wrong with this design, uh, and, it, um, and it, it, it could work. The, the uh, one thing that you would have to do in order to avoid bias is if you told, if, if people did refuse, if they said, well, thank you very much, but I don't want to get that treatment, I want the other treatment, you'd have to include them anyway in the arm to which they were randomized because otherwise it would be like people selecting their own treatment and then you'd be back in the observational type study. wouldn't be a randomized study. So this would only work if very few people refused the treatment that, that, that they were given. And um, so, so I went to work at the National Cancer Institute in 1982 and there was a lot of excitement about this design. A lot of the investigators you know, really liked it. They thought this was going to be a way to help um, get, uh, get people on to studies that were difficult. Uh, to accrue to. And I, I wasn't so sure about this design. Um, and my initial hesitation was because I worried that there was nothing, there was, the, the design was fine, but in the implementation of this design, an investigator could clearly um, tailor the presentation of the study, essentially the informed consent process, uh, in favor of the treatment that that particular patient had been assigned. So if this patient had been assigned treatment B, uh, the, uh, the physician uh, trying to, you know, uh, offering the study to, could, could say, and if you're in the study, you will get this treatment, and this is really the best treatment for you, and, um, and, and you know, and, and actually say very little about the other treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was nothing to, there was nothing to, now, you could have a consent document that had all the right things in it, but... Mostly what people get out of informed consent, I think, is what, if they get anything out of it, and that's another question, is what, the, uh, is what they're told in the, right. verbally in the process. So I was worried that um, the whole informed consent process could be undermined um, in this way. I mean, in principle, the person should be told that the treatment was chosen at random. And if there was an informed consent document that was approved by an IRB, presumably the IRB would have made sure that that language was in there. But, um, but the, there was nothing to require the, the presenting physician to say your treatment has been chosen by a flip of a coin. And in fact, I will tell you that when I talked to some physicians uh, about this design, they would tell me they loved this design because they didn't have to talk about the other treatment and they didn't have to tell the patient that, um, that uh, he or she was being randomized. So it was, and they didn't understand. It wasn't as though that they were... Uh, 
that they were cheating. They really didn't understand that this was not a design where people could just pick, you know, the treatment that they want or that they could, that, you know, that, that it was a way to avoid essentially, essentially a true informed consent. I don't think Professor Zellin uh, believed that, you know, had in mind that physicians would skirt the, uh, the, the process and do what I said that they would do. I think, I, I think he assumed that they would present the study fairly, but there was nothing to ensure that they, uh, that they did. Yeah. Um, the other thing that happened while, uh, you know, while I was sort of thinking about this and worrying about this problem was that there were several trials that were ongoing using this design, and it turned out that the rate of um, people refusing the treatment was not as low as what had been hoped. And in fact, and in some trials it was quite high, and it turned out that if as many as 15 percent of the people refused the drug, uh, on, on each of the two arms, you needed twice as many patients as you would have needed otherwise. Now what Professor Zellin had said was, even if you do need more people, because you'll be able to recruit so much more easily, you'll make up for that. But it turned out that the trials that had switched to this model had, for the most part, with one uh, important exception, um, had not doubled. Had not had not increased their accrual to the rate that it was making up for the for the refusals. Um, one or two trials even switched back to standard randomization because the refusal rate was so high. And again, I think people felt uh, that the problem was that physicians didn't understand. In in that case, where the refusal rate was very high, they were basically saying you can choose whatever you want. They thought it, this was a way for for people to just choose their treatments, which of course that wasn't the that wasn't the intention at all. So there was some misunderstanding of the design in a lot of different, different ways. So, um, so I, I decided to uh, write this up, and I wrote a paper that showed what the experience was. And I should say that the trial in which this seemed to be a big success was the very famous trial done uh, by um, Bernie Fisher and the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project of mastectomy versus lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can well imagine, that was a very, very difficult trial to accrue to. If you can just imagine, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, and you say, well, we would like to flip a coin to see whether we can you know, just take out the lump or to take your breast off. I mean, that this is, you, it's hard to imagine a harder trial to accrue to. So they were having difficulties, and they found that when they switched to the pre-randomization approach, the accrual went up not by a factor of two, but by a factor of four or five. Oh. Um, and, and they were able to complete, complete this trial. So there was one huge success. But the other trials that were using this were not, uh, being so successful, and so I wrote a paper where I documented what the experience had been in the five or six trials that had used this, plus raised my own concerns about, um, you know, how how this could lead to an undermining of the informed consent process, and and that paper was published, and um, you know, it's hard to make connections with, um, it's hard to make connections with, uh, with with any kind of causal connections, but I do know that. The enthusiasm for this design seemed to diminish, um, whether it had anything to do with my paper or whether it had more to do with it that people were seeing that it wasn't really working, you know, I don't know. But it's, it certainly was probably the first, um, the first area for me where I saw the, um, the interaction between statistical aspects of a study design that I was trained to worry about and the ethical aspects of a study.